You may be seated. God bless you. This morning, I want to continue. Thank you so much. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you. I want to continue the, the line of thought I'm towing from yesterday night. Um, I believe God will bring us deeper, more specific, and personal as touching this emphasis the subject of sound like i began yesterday is a very sensitive subject in the spirit and i know god will not just bring us deeper understanding as all the seasoned ministers coming after me would be teaching but i also know god will be bringing us into experiences and into dimensions of the spirit using this spiritual reality but my thank you thank you it's okay. the many possibilities that will be accessing in the course of this conference i told us yesterday that spirits move on the frequency of sound when you hear sounds in the spirit you can be rest assured that the spirit is in motion he said when the day of pentecost was fully come they heard a sound as of a rushing mighty wind and instantly the place where they were was filled with the holy ghost Acts chapter 2 from verse 1 to 4. And they began to speak in tongues. And we also saw yesterday that apart from the fact that sound transports spirits, sound is also a system of activating seasons in the lives of believers, in territories, even dispensations. Sounds open up seasons. The season of the Holy Ghost, the era of the Spirit began with a sound. The Bible said Jesus would descend with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the end will begin. So, sounds open seasons. But most importantly, I said for this conference, we are particular. Because Revelation 11.15 said, when the seventh trumpet was sounded, he said there was... A lot of talking, speakings, and noise in the heavens. And a distinct voice spoke and said, The kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. So I said, this particular kind of sound is for establishing the government of God. The dominion of God. And if you are a Bible student, you would know that dominion, is one of God's desires when he put man on this side of the divide. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, after creating man, he said, let them have dominion. Let them exercise dominion. And so when we are dealing with a subject like we are about to look at this morning, what should be at the center of your heart is the ability to exercise and to execute government to exert the dominion of God in your sphere of influence and wherever it is God has placed you hallelujah and so this morning I want to share with us some of the ingredients of dominion some of the requirements of dominion in order to exercise government and governance over a system and over a territory these things don't just happen in genesis chapter 1 chapter 2 and chapter 3 you would see that before god ever told the man to have dominion there were four things he gave him before he added dominion to it 
Number one, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it said, Let us make man in our own image. That's the glory of God, that's the essence of God. If man does not have the image of God, he cannot exercise dominion. Number two, he said, Let us make man in our own likeness. That's the righteous character of God. And God didn't stop there. In Genesis chapter 3, from verse 8, he said, In the cool of the day, the voice of God came walking in the garden. That's the presence of God. Eden itself is the atmosphere of God's presence. So man has to be in God's presence to exercise dominion. And then number four, we saw in Genesis 2, 9, that the Bible said God planted trees in the garden. There were trees that were good for food, but he said in the midst of the garden is the tree of life. So God gave man life. So for a man that would exercise dominion, there must be the image of God, there must be the likeness of God, there must be the presence of God, and there must be the life of God. These four things are necessary before man can begin to speak of dominion. So dominion is not something that happens. It's actually something you exercise because of who you have become in God. And so this morning, I want to take out time to expound on these things a bit more to show us how important it is as touching, exerting God's government and also to show us what we must do in order to attain these levels in God. Because if we don't, the seventh trumpet will mean nothing to us. Because scriptures reveal to us the whole idea about the seventh trumpet is to make the kingdom of this world to become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. So in the heart of God, every one of us seated here should be able to exercise his dominion. Every one of us seated here should be able to exercise his government wherever it is he has placed us. It's our lack of understanding that makes us think after God deploys us to a place, God still wants to come there. The way God thinks is different. If God sends you to the bank, as far as it's concerned, he's already in the bank. If God sends you to a city, as far as it's concerned, he's already in that city. And so if you cannot exercise God's government in that city, largely what you do may be religion. But you see, exercising God's government is not something you just desire. It's not a product of wishful thinking. There is a definite protocol. There are definite requirements to attaining that level of authority. And so this morning, I'll give you seven of the requirements for exercising God's government in a system or in a territory. And so I'll begin from where I left it off yesterday. My whole subject and discussion yesterday was the ability not just to contact God, but to also embody God and to image God. And that's what I call reflecting the Christ. That was basically what I was speaking about yesterday. I had to trace it from our encounter with Jesus the Savior to our encounter with Jesus the Son. So in order to give perspective to my conversation this morning, I will take it off from there again. And so the first requirement for exerting God's government in a place is your ability to image God. That means you contact God, you contain or embody God, and you reflect God's essence. If you are not able to image God, trust me, all the doctrines you know, all the scriptures you know, no matter how loud you quote them, you will not affect the princes in the territory. Because when spirits deal with men, they know that for a man to have authority in their realm, a spirit must put his credibility on that man. And for a spirit to put his credibility on a man, that man must reflect that spirit. So if they don't see the reflection of the spirit you claim to represent, no matter how loud and audacious you talk about him, they know you don't know him. They know you don't have his validation. 
And because of that, they will mess you up. You know the story of the sons of Sceva? In the name of Jesus, which Paul preaches, we adjure you to come out of him. The spirit pounced on them, dealt with them, brutalized them. And unfortunately, this is what many Christians face every day. They speak boldly about God, audaciously about God, then the devil comes to the family with sickness. The devil comes to the family with poverty. The devil comes to the family with death. And so while they are in the public screaming about the all-powerful God, talking a lot of mysteries about God, when they go back to their bedrooms, they are weeping and crying. Oh God, when will you show up? Oh God, what is wrong? Oh God, what is the missing link? So ideally, they expect God to show up. But experientially, as touching existential issues, they know God has not shown up. And so they are left with a frustration that they cannot rationalize. And in order to keep faith, they keep declaring God, proclaiming God. But deep in their hearts, they know they are confused. Deep in their hearts, they know they are frustrated. Deep down in their hearts, they know this thing is not working. And I can tell you this morning that one of the reasons why Although you scream the name of Jesus, although you think you believe God with all your heart, but you cannot see God's endorsement. You cannot see God's validation. You cannot see God's manifestation. It's because your appearance in the spirit betrays what you, you, you try to represent. You want everybody to feel that you believe in God. You represent God. But when they check you in the spirit, you don't look like him. And because we don't look like him, Many things that he wants to give to those who represent him. We can't have it. Look at the military personnel you see around. They can't move around with guns without wearing their uniforms. Because even themselves will be endangered. So there are many things you can't carry until you sustain certain appearances. And so the power we want to command, the influence we want to command, the change we want to command, it takes a certain level of appearance to command it. All of you seated here, people, some specific persons directed you to sit. Why did you obey them? It's because of the tax they are wearing. So you don't need to ask them, what is your name? You don't need to ask them, where do you come from? The moment you see them with that tag, you know they have the authority to do what they are doing. So when we are calling the name of God, trying to enforce kingdom, and they look at us and we don't look like God, then the demons are confused. This thing you are trying to do, there is a specific set of people that have the credentials to do it. And we are not seeing it in you. Why do you want to enforce what you don't represent? And so we begin to have contradictions. And so for you to exert dominion, for you to make the kingdom of this world, to become the kingdom of our God, of necessity, you must reflect Christ. Even Jesus, when he came, one of the weapons he wielded was the fact that he looked like the father. And so because he looked like the father, when he speaks, they have no choice but to obey him. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. He said, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He said, had in this last day spoken to us by his son. Now, where is the authority? Look at it in that scripture. Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. That's in verse 3. Help me quick. Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. And the next thing he said was government. Upholding all things. So you cannot uphold all things except as you are the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. So kingdom does not begin with mobilization. Kingdom does not begin with commissioning. A lot of people are passionate. They want to represent God. Send us around the nations. Send us to the cities. Send us to the territory. Those are very beautiful and noble passions. But the first thing you must do is to be sure without anybody who doesn't really know you clapping for you. You need to be sure this God I proclaim, do I look like him? Do I really reflect him? 
Am I really like this God I speak about? If you don't reflect him, then the first point of reference is not a catchment area. The first point of reference is not a constituency. The first point of reference is what must I do to reflect him? When you start reflecting him, commissioning will come naturally because this is what is in the heart of the father he wants to deploy us but the question is do we look like him and that's why i was talking about sonship yesterday about reflecting the father because truly we have learned a set of doctrines truly we have learned cliches truly we have learned religious lifestyle but we don't reflect god many times follow a christian to his workplace and make the mistake of calling him man of God. You will see how shocked his colleagues are. Who is man of God? This person. <laughs> we, you don't know him. We know him. We have not seen anything in his life that suggests that he's man of God. Because when we compromise, he compromises with us. When we cheat, he cheats with us. When we lie, he lies with us. So forget that he knows some things in the Bible. Forget the Bible knowledge. He's a theologian. If he's man of God, we doubt. So everyone who wants to reflect God's kingdom must first of all reflect God's image. And I told you yesterday that reflecting God's image is a system of beholding. You behold him to become like him. If you don't behold him, you can't become like him. There is no rule or regulation that can make you become like God. There's no resolution that can make you become like God. Many persons wake up 1st of January and they have a list of many resolutions. This year, I will not do this. This year, I will not do that. You will discover that before January 1st is over, you would have broken 40% of your resolution. If you keep it until March, it means something strange happened to you that you are not aware of. Resolutions don't help. Rules don't help. Laws don't help. What changes you and impacts the image of God to you is when you behold him and you behold him in the word and you behold him in prayer i told you jeremiah 33 verse 3 he said ask of me i will answer but i will not only answer he said i will show you great and mighty things that you know not of now if you are praying not to receive answer you will discover that prayer for you is not prayer points it's prayer life because if your assignment is to behold, you will know that it's not something you can jump in and out. Father, and you bring your list of shopping and you shop from the realm of God and you go away. If you know you came to see, you will tarry there for long. Because if it's the one showing you, it means you no longer operate by your own timeline. You will operate by his own timeline. Because he will decide when he will show up. And if he shows up, he will decide how long you are there. To see what you need to see. You now see why the generation of prayer points, the generation of prayer manuals have not helped a generation. Has not helped a people. It helps children to receive things. But if it's kingdom we are looking for, prayer manuals, prayer points can't take us far. Because what we want to do is to behold. So when our answers come, we will still stay for him to show us great and mighty things it's in showing us that we become because the law of the spirit is that what you see is what you become he said it does not yet appear what we shall be like but when we shall see him we shall be like him and then if you want to behold you also behold in the world because the world is the image of the christ the image of the christ are not the pictures we have in our offices they are not the pictures we have in our phones. They are not the pictures. When you type Jesus online, you are going to see a lot of pictures. That's not the image of Christ. The image of Christ is the revealed word of God. Paul said in Galatians chapter 3 from verse 1, when he wanted to paint Christ to the people, he painted Christ through the gospel. So it's your understanding of the gospel that reveals to you the image of the Christ. And so many persons have not understood the word of God. They've not understood the gospel. So they have pictures of individuals in their head and that's why they don't know the Christ. 
And because they don't know the Christ, they are not like the Christ. And because they are not like the Christ, they cannot exercise government. And there are other people who know that you can find Christ in the scripture. But the problem is, they are looking for scriptures to preach. You don't take over by preaching. You take over by emitting God. And so if your message does not come from a standpoint of a revelation, a revelation that has first of all impacted you, it cannot impact your world. That verse of scripture you are quoting, how deep has he impacted you? If it has not impacted you, how do you think it will impact your society? Because both you and your society are suffering the same thing. So you have to sit on it until it transforms you before you can believe that it can transform others. It's like our generation today, they see a message online, they've not heard it. It has not blessed them. It has not impacted them. They are now telling their friend, watch this. And then you now ask the person, what did you hear in that message? He didn't listen. Now, it's a good thing to share. It's a good thing to make available. But if that message has not touched you, what makes you feel it will touch your friend? When you are preaching a message sometimes, they say, tell them. Tell who? If it has not touched you, what makes you feel it will touch them? And so if you want to exercise government, you must look into the word until the word is made flesh. It's when the word is made flesh that you behold its glory. And it's when you behold its glory that grace and truth is expressed. And so you have to sit on the word, eat the word, until the word is made flesh in you. When the word is made flesh in you, then you can behold his glory. And when you behold his glory, then grace and truth can proceed from it. It is that grace and truth that is the instrument of governance. But unfortunately, most of us don't do business with the world. When God was teaching me about doing business with the world, he told me there are four layers of interacting with the world. He said the first layer is to read. When you read it, you become aware. Reading brings acquaintance and awareness. First Timothy 4.13, he said, until I come, give attendance to reading. And he said, when you are done reading, he said, you now go into study. Second Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And he said, there are two dimensions to study. He said, studying is exhortation and doctrine. That's why 1 Timothy 4.13 said, reading, exhortation, and doctrine. Because no matter how you read, there are things you can't find. So somebody who has found something, when you listen to that person, he brings you into the atmosphere of what he has found. That's why you go to exhortation. That means, for instance, if I want to understand faith, I now listen to Bishop David Oedeko. He has caught something in faith. It's not just theory. He has proven it. And so as I'm listening to it, he shows me something in faith that I don't know. And I'm exhorted. That's exhortation. So exhortation means gleaning from the research of another man. Then when you do that, he said you must do doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is not just a set of belief system. No. Doctrine is for you to find out contextual truths because of your own labor of research. So if I want to understand what love is, I may have to type love in my Bible and get every verse that speaks about love. When I gather it, I will separate the ones that does not have to do with transformation. Because there's a love that can be, Isaac loved his wife. That's not what I'm looking for. So I'll first of all excavate all of that from my study. Then I'll start studying what explains and expounds on love. As I gather it and read it in context, I will now know what God means when he talks about love. So I will understand love from an action to a nature and beyond the nature to the person of God. So I know that if I love, it means I'm like God. And that kind of journey will be a journey that I explore through doctrine. That is when interacting with the world becomes labor. But you see, many are not willing to labor. They just want to pick a verse of scripture to create impression. And that you came to a city and quoted many verses that impress people does not mean you have affected the fabric of that city. Governance have not come there. This is why we travel from place to place, preach to people, they clap hands, they jump up. 
but we go, not much happen. Meanwhile, the fathers of old who didn't preach as much revelation, some of them just walk through a city and the city is impacted. There are men who enter a city when they do a meeting, they may not even gather crowd. They talk to 15 people, talk to 30 people, they leave. You're now here, three months later, that the revival is in that city. And the revival is not just people acting in a certain way. 50 years later, you hear that alcoholism has ended. 50 years later, you hear that abortion has ended. And you are wondering, what did they do? Sometimes, it's only one verse of scripture they sit on. The first time I listened to Billy Akani, I wept for hours. And the man was just preaching from one verse of scripture. Because you are neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. I can't remember the line of revelation. I can't remember the exhortation. But because you are neither hot nor cold, was in my heart for over two years. I'm moving somewhere because you are neither hot nor cold. Because you are neither hot. Why did that verse travel with me? How did he study it? What did he do with that verse that he just quoted it and that verse made me a prisoner? Because the word was flesh in him. He was not quoting a scripture he read. He was not quoting a scripture he heard somebody say. Perhaps he prayed with that scripture for 10 years. Perhaps he prayed with that scripture for 5 years. And so when he releases that scripture into your spirit, that scripture will also traumatize you for 5 years. That scripture will also traumatize you for 10 years. And until you get to where that scripture took him, the scripture will not leave you. So he didn't read to preach. He read to become. And so anywhere he goes to tell you what he know, you too must become. And so their words are not just revelations they are communicating. They are witnesses they are bringing to a territory. And so when they leave that territory, there must be a mark in that territory. So these are not preachers. They are witnesses. They have become. They have embodied. So they can communicate it to a generation. We all with unveiled faces, beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord, we are changed. Trust me, brothers and sisters, if all of us sitting here today are changed, Abiyokuta will be too small. All of us sitting here. And this thing I'm sharing with you, I'm still learning it. In fact, I'm a kindergarten in it. Imagine if five of us master this. You will just hear that a man came to town and prayed for three days and left. He didn't talk to anybody. And suddenly, because he came, some angels will no longer leave that city. And people start having encounters just because somebody came to town. No crusade, no packing out a, a, an auditorium. He just came into town. And he left something in that town that will not allow the people rest. And you'll see things begin to change. God's servant was sharing with me about a patriarch yesterday and my peace left me. How that in this same city, he just came into this city and the day it fell. And for many years, things were happening because one man came. And today our glory is that we travel all around the world. In fact, we take pride in it. I was in Canada yesterday I'll be in London tomorrow. I'm in Ghana next week. And I'll be in Amsterdam, upper week. The question is, all the places you went to, what happened? When you left, what is the signature? We pride ourselves. I'm a lecturer. I've been in this university for 15 years. You have been here and there's no revival. What have you been doing? Meanwhile, God told Joshua, anywhere you march your feet, I've given to you. How come you have walked around one campus for 15 years? And the signature of God is not there. And you are not ashamed. You are saying it. You need a retreat. Somebody tells you, I, am, I, I control this market. Control which market? The market that is full of thieves. How come people don't have encounters? Because we are not changed. But you see, every city Jesus entered, the impact remained until this day. There is a proof that he went there. You cannot erase it because when he came, God came. When he showed up, God showed up. And the apostles embodied the same thing. The Bible says Philip went to Samaria. He preached Christ there. And the whole city was filled with joy. 
this guy was not an apostle this guy was not a prophet he was a deacon and in our context today it's not even the kind of deacons we have it's actually an usher who is who is ordained to attend to tables their duty was to share food how can somebody who is assigned to sharing food enter a city and the whole city has revival how can somebody who is supposed to share meat go to a city and the city suddenly erupts in revival that means all the while that philip was sitting in the apostolic community it was out of honor and order a city was actually on his inside and he had the capacity to release that city but here is a generation we have all the packaging we have all the title we have all the connection we have all the influence with men and we have all the fame and popularity and when we come to a city we exert all of our natural credentials but the principalities are watching who are these people what are they doing we leave that city after all the activity you will not hear that people had encounters in brothels you will not hear that atheists are repenting you will not hear that drunkards and then we carry that same jamboree to another location if the kingdom of this world must become the kingdom of our god and his christ all of us need to go back to our closet again and ask god is he you we are carrying from place to place or is our knowledge or is our theology or is our philosophy or is our ideology this is why this is called a believers meeting so that we can think we can meditate we can reflect and tell ourselves the truth some of us seated here are campus students and the campus does not even know that we are around meanwhile when we come into our small fellowship we are papa at the age of 22 you are papa that means by the time you are 28 you will be a grandpapa and by 30 you will leave this world <laughs> how can somebody at 22 be papa and you are coming into the service the three four protocols follow you meanwhile the campus is not aware that you are there the principalities are not aware that you are there in fact nowadays when we pray we impress ourselves and when we are done impressing ourselves we go away the priest is not even bother coming for our meeting anymore because it's a waste of time to come everybody who is there praying is already their servant so there's no need after that prayer they will come back home he said we all with unveiled faces beholding us in the glass the glory of the lord we are changed please hear me tell yourself i will not leave this meeting until i have a definite encounter forget about the title forget about the popularity forget about the applause tell yourself if all god will do for me is to give me an encounter that will change me let it be enough for me every other thing will follow after that but by all means you must come to that point where you say I won't lie to myself anymore. I know I have a prayer group. I know I have a fellowship. I know I'm a traveling minister. I know people know me. But the truth is, me and myself know that I don't look like Jesus. If my secret life were to be made public, all my invitations will end. If my secret life were to be made public, all my honor will end. If my secret life were to be made public, all the glory and the applause will end. If that's where you are, you have to ask God, please do something to me. I can't continue with this fake life that wins all the applause of men, but no spirit recognizes that I'm around. Something definite must happen to me. It's the first requirement for dominion. You can't exert kingdom except as you become like him. And you have to keep becoming like him for every level of authority that you exert. I don't know why God is keeping me here. I don't know why I can't go further from here. But if this is all God wants me to emphasize, then my role is done from here. We all, with unveiled faces, beholding as in the glass, the glory of the Lord, we are changed. What do I look like? That's the question we must leave this meeting with. What do I look like? Jesus met the Pharisees. They had all the religion in the world. 
In fact, the pride of the Pharisee is that he has a record. He's known to be a prayer champion. The Bible says when they pray, they stand by street corners and they take pride in praying for long so that men will know that they pray. And you know how Jesus called them? He said, you are of your father the devil. And he said, the lust of your father shall ye do. So as spiritual as prayer is, they turn prayer to a carnal activity. So even a spiritual thing can be made carnal by a man who does not look like God. Because the one who judges not what men see, but what men don't see, he will judge you based on what you look like. And he looked, like, he looked at prayer champions, he looked at religious devouts, and he told them, you are of your father the devil. What an assessment. Meanwhile, these were custodians of the Torah. They knew all the laws of Moses. But Jesus came and said, no, you look like the devil in the spirit. When I see you, you look like the devil. That's why you can't advance kingdom. What do I look like? That should be our burden this morning. Do I look like the God I profess? Or do I truly look like the devil? And it is even worse when you have eternal life but you have not transformed to look like Jesus. So the life of God is in you, but in manifestation and in appearance, you are expressing and releasing energy that is demonic. When anger comes out of you, it can erupt a city. When your pride shows up, it can dwarf a king. When jealousy arises in your spirit, it can murder even a child. Meanwhile, you are the best speaker. You are the best worshiper. So much spiritual activity, but little of God in essence. Who do I look like? He said, we all with open faces, beholding us in the glass. The glory of the Lord, we are changed. Do we want to exact dominion? Dominion does not begin with activities. It begins with looking like Jesus. Let's make progress. If I can't finish, I'll just list them. We are spiritual people. The Holy Ghost will teach us. Praise God. The second thing about dominion is intimacy. In this kingdom, your authority is tied to the height where you are talking from. If you don't have a deep walk with God, you cannot exact his dominion. The problem with us is that we live a very shallow life but we want to talk deep things and we want to demand deep results. And so you find somebody who has no work with God. He is talking things that men who have buried themselves in God's presence are talking. And sometimes, because he's eloquent and he has charisma, he even says it better than those who truly live there. I was at the redemption camp last week and Daddy Gio said something and I looked my, at myself, I almost felt I've wasted my youth. He said, when he started ministry, he told God, I, I didn't want to be a pastor. You asked me to be. So I will not be an ordinary pastor. And he said, God replied to him, if you want to be a pastor like Jesus, you know how Jesus did it. He said, let's begin with when Jesus, where Jesus started from. And he now checked his mind and discovered he knew where Jesus started from. He said, Jesus started with 40 days fasting and prayer. <laughs> and he told himself, I've not been able to fast till three. How can I attempt this? But he said somewhere in his heart again, his mathematical mind began to probe him. And he said, okay, let's start with three days. I'm telling you, there are certain authorities and powers that is beyond quoting a scripture you heard. There are certain authorities and powers that is beyond wearing a suit and appearing like a man of God. There are certain authorities and powers that is beyond appearing pious. Because... It is the undoing of men. Men judge based on outward appearance. That's the nature of men. But if you are looking for true authority, you must go to the deep. 
He said, they that journey to the deep, they are the ones that see the wonders of God. I'm telling you, most of our lack of manifestation, the bankruptcy of manifestation is an attestation of our depths of intimacy. Because if you go deeper, it must show. Intimacy will never lie. If you go deeper, it shows. It's like a relationship between a boy and a girl. If you are shaking hands only, there is a manifestation to it. If you are hugging, there is a manifestation to it. And if you enter intimacy, you can't hide it. After nine months, your stomach will reveal that something happened. Intimacy cannot betray itself. It must speak. Our lack of manifestation is an attestation of our shallow work with God. No matter how we project it, you can come to the altar and not smile and look up like a cherubim. When you start operating, the bankruptcy of manifestation will tell where you are. That thing is caricature. God's servant said, he did three days for some time. When he mastered it, he now went to five days. He now went to seven days. He now went to 21 days until he was able to hit 40 days and 40 nights. I said, what? 40 days. While I was contemplating, he now said in one year, he did it three times. I said, wait, am I hearing well? What did he say now? I tapped the person sitting next to me. He said in one year, he did 40 days and 40 nights fast three times. I don't know if he was drinking water. But even if he didn't drink water, that is four months out of one year. A man was in God's presence doing what he's doing. You now show up and say, let us strategize. If we have the right b boss, if we have the right audio clips, we will we, we, we gather 100,000. <laughs> if you can get the attention of 5,000 people, know that the spirit is involved. For 5,000 people to leave what they are doing, to come to where you are, is beyond strategy. No strategy can make it happen. But this is a generation of Facebook and YouTube. Before you know, there's an ad. You hear a loud sound like an earthquake and then man of God appear. And then you start hearing some deep utterance. When you finish it, there'll be 200 people there. Because your intimacy is what determines your influence. Your audience will reduce to the size of your intimacy. There's nothing you can do about it. If you like, go and hire a company that is into publicity. When they finish doing the whole publicity, you come, you'll be 12. Because the angels that are commissioned to advance your influence, to advance government through you, they follow orders. And those orders come from the depths. And if you have not journeyed to the deep, you will not have the verdicts of God. So intimacy is the second basis for exercising dominion. I know how to preach a message that can make you shout. But I'm telling you, these are the foundation of Christian authority and power. Where are you standing with God? When Elijah came to the king, he didn't have popularity. He had to even introduce himself. So it's not popularity that commands authority. Imagine a man who has to introduce himself has the power to shut the heavens. And he came, he said, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, came to the palace and stood before the king. 1 Kings 17 verse 1 and 2. And he said, before God whom I stand. That's all the credential I have. I don't know how to do advertisement. I don't know how to build connection with men. But I know how to stand somewhere. Before God whom I stand, there shall be no rain or dew. And he didn't say except God speaks. He said except at my word. And he walked away. I know the king will look at him and say, when did you start allowing clowns come into my palace? How did he come here? This man, imagine what he's wearing. How, don't you know the apparels that princes wear? He's not even wearing a royal apparel. How did you allow him to come before me? After seven days, there was no rain. After 14 days, no rain. After 21 days, no rain. And I said, come, that man that came the other day, what did he say his name was again? That's how you become popular. It's your manifestation that introduced you. What did he say his name was? They'll say, we didn't know, but is there something like a lie something? Don't worry, you'll soon go and look for him. After two months, no rain, come. That name, what did he call himself, himself again? They said Elijah. Where did he come from? They said, he said he's a Tishbite. 
Go and search. Go to the whole of Gilead. Search. We must find him. Elijah hid himself. So while others are struggling to be everywhere, some hide. You will look for them. They have authority. You don't exercise government by being everywhere. You exercise government by being in the presence. Before God, whom I stand, and the king for the next two years, his primary assignment on the throne was to search for Elijah. And everybody was were searching until when Obadiah found him, he said, the king has been looking for you all these years. And Elijah said, go and tell the king and come in. He said, as surely as the Lord God liveth, I won't leave you. You know why? They now discovered another thing. That Elijah was not walking about. He was traveling by a whirlwind. He said, if I go to the king before I come back, God will carry you. So they now knew that the guy had journeyed in intimacy until he had developed a technology for his own transportation. We can't find you. So the reason you are scarce is not because you are hiding. It's because you are being carried. It's God himself that is carrying you. So you can be in a place. When we get there, you have left. One second ago, you were here. One second later, you are in another location. That's why we can't find you. All of that is before God whom I stand. And the next time Elijah showed up, the whole nation gathered. No b-board, no publicity, no strategy, no stunt before God whom I stand. And he came and gave instruction to the king, gather all the prophets of Baal. King became boy. That's government. That's dominion. It's not about, see, check for instance, see how many messages we have online. One apostle has 2,000 messages on the internet. One apostle. And there are over 10 of us. There are over 30 of us. Imagine the message. Revival has not yet come. Does it not suggest to you that there is something? Meanwhile, we heard that a man wrote a message and read it. He didn't preach it. He read it. Seen as in the hands of an angry God. And the whole city erupted. One message. He wrote it and read it. And those who were there said, he was wearing a very thick eyeglasses because he wasn't seeing clearly. That means he didn't even read it charismatically. That means he read it stuttering. He read it with minorism, speech minorism. And when he was done reading the message, the whole city erupted. Both those who were in the meeting and those who were not in the meeting. What is the problem? Before God, whom I stand, there's no intimacy. We are popular people. We are charismatic people. We are strategic people. We are smart people. We are intelligent people, but we are not intimate people. The day all of us begin to bury ourselves deeper in God, we will begin to command authorities that are unseen. This is a believer's meeting. Where are you standing? You know, I've been asking questions. The first question I ask is what? Who do I look like? The second question I'm asking now is, where are you standing? Your authority is tied to where you are standing. Before God, whom I stand, there shall be no rain, nor dew. Number three. I have many scriptures, but I, I can't go into them. Number three is the light that you emit. We are talking dominion. We are talking governance. In John chapter 1, from verse 1 to verse 4, and I use Jesus as a case study because he's the pattern man. He said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And he said, the same was in the beginning with God. And he said, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And he said, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And he said something. He said, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So, darkness is a government. Light is also a government. What comes out of you is what determines the extent to which you can exact government. Because 
what comes out of you is the type of witness that you carry. And spirits know this truth. So a spirit is not so moved by what you are saying. A spirit is moved by the energy that is coming out of you. And so a spirit can allow you to say all the right things, but have all the wrong energy. And because you have all the wrong energy, it will counter all the right things that you are saying. Because they know how the realm works. So you can be coming to a city to preach. All the spirit wants to do, will need to do, is to get somebody to say something that puts anger in you. To say something that puts bitterness in you. And the moment he's able to plant that bitterness, that is all. He will leave you to go and preach your excellent message. He will leave you to go and declare all your excellent proclamation. But you know what? Corruption has entered. While you are talking, although your words are correct, but bitterness is what you are emitting. Bitterness. So the atmosphere will be saturated with the bitterness. Men may not pick it, but spirits know it. And so you will leave that meeting. The words you hear will not last with you for five minutes, but something has happened to your soul structure. And the next four months, you will not realize that every action you carry out will be filled with bitterness. You received it from somewhere. You can be going to a place to preach a correct message, doctrine right, but a spirit will allow you to touch something that defies you. And so a man fornicates and he enters a place and he says, no, I'm forgiving. No problem. If that's all you know, but there's more to it. Because you have indulged in that fornication, something has happened to your soul structure. And so you come, even if you are preaching holiness, you are preaching hell is real. The people hearing you, as they leave that place, they will start having strange encounters. And you will be shocked that some will have dreams and they will suddenly start seeing themselves sleeping with people. Meanwhile, they heard a correct message, but another energy entered them. And then from that meeting, people will leave and some of them will start struggling with what they have long ago conquered. You'll find many go back to pornography. Many go back to masturbation. Many go back to immorality. Because you transmitted that energy. You had the right doctrine, but your energy was wrong. And spirits know this. So what spirits do is that they corrupt the soul structure, but they allow the intelligence to be right. So intelligence, sonesis, exegesis, correct. But soul structure is a poison. Paul said, because we love you so much, 1 Thessalonians 2 8. He said, We did not only teach you the gospel, he said, We also imparted into you the substance of our soul. A young lady ran to me crying, What was the problem? She was hearing an apostle preaching, and in the natural, the intelligence of the message was something else. But while she was hearing the same message, she dozed off, and as she dozed off, she was fornicating. I thought when you are hearing somebody and you doze off. You should touch the spiritual context of the message. Yes. But what she touched was actually fornication. So she was hearing a man preaching powerfully. Talking about the power of God. Talking about the glory of God. She slept. Instead of seeing cherubims. Instead of seeing herself move in power. She suddenly discovered she was sleeping. Now that's the energy that was being transmitted. That was the reality that was being transmitted. But in the natural. Because she didn't have discernment. She didn't know. So, she was interacting with the message in the brain, but their spirit was being compromised. And this is why I will emphasize again, be careful with people that tell you what you do does not matter. Because what you do really matters. That's what determines your essence. And when you go out to exact God's government, you will discover that what you are not saying will impact the people much more than what you are saying. This is why in the body of Christ today, you see sometimes a lot of arrogance. Why is it so? Message correct, essence arrogance. And so people use revelation to defy authorities. People use revelation to demonstrate lawlessness and lack of order. And if you are not spiritual, you will judge what is being preached, but you cannot discern the essence. And the essence is superior to the message. Today, immorality 
is like a plague in the body of Christ. Meanwhile, so many preaching on fire, so many preaching on revival, so many preaching on holiness. Why is it almost like seven out of every ten young people is either hooked up in pornography, hooked up in masturbation, or hooked up in immorality? Meanwhile, we are all preaching fire, fire, fire. In fact, fire is everywhere. Because message correct, essence defied. And so if you want to exert dominion, if it's popularity you want, you can do anything and be popular. In fact, in a generation where everybody loves prayer, everybody wants holiness, everybody wants revival. If you start talking about revival, talking about prayer, you'll become popular. Sing a song on prayer, you become popular. But the question is, is the essence right? What are you emitting? What is the witness? Because if it's government we are looking for, I'm showing you this so that you will know that if it has to do with government, 90% is in the closet. It's 10% that is in the public. If all of these things are not checked, we can have the most strategic gatherings, we can have the best of messages, we can have the greatest of audience, but when you check the essence, it will be wrong. And God is not so moved by the activity. Because God is building. And because he's building, he prefers quality to quantity. The Bible said as soon as Zion is built up, he said God will appear in his glory. He is building something. He is building something. And so the second question of dominion is the question of essence. What light are you emitting? What is coming out of you? I know your doctrine is correct. I know your passion is genuine. But what light are you emitting? This is why if the devil has gotten your inner man, go back and take a redress so that you don't become the reason why innocent people will fall into fornication, innocent people will fall into arrogance, innocent people will fall into pride, innocent people will fall into fear because over and above the message you are preaching, something is being transmitted underneath silently. That is where government is. And so if the devil sees that you are being popular, he can even help your popularity while he's injecting corruption into your soul. Because the more people hear you, the more he's able to try. Did you not read about Jesus? The devil knew that when Jesus left that mountain, his fame would be spread abroad. He didn't come to stop the process. He only came to add corruption. If I add corruption, go out. Let your fame spread abroad. But while you are being spread, you will transmit my government. And Jesus knew it. So Jesus conquered the battle of essence. He didn't allow anything to defy his essence. So that when he goes out, what he will, dis he will disseminate will be the kingdom of God. I know we love God. I know we have passion for his kingdom. I know we want to do much for God. And in this conference, God will commission a lot of us. But one thing that we must always check is, what is my essence? Ideally, if I want to speak the truth to myself, what is my essence? Am I the message I'm preaching? Because this thing has to be the preacher and his preaching. It has to be the message and the messenger. Because if there is a contradiction between the preacher and the preaching, if there's a contradiction between the message and the messenger, then government cannot be exercised. And so, everybody may not know who you truly are, but you have to sit down and ask yourself, what is my essence? I know my message is correct. I know my message is accepted. But the question is, what I am emitting, is it consistent with my message? Because over time, your followers will prove what you are preaching. The truth of your message is not just in the exegesis. It's in the quality of followers you raise. Because your followers are the proofs of the essence of your message. And when you see a body where a lot of people are held down in captivity, then it's time to look away from the message and start looking at the messengers. Who are these people saying these things? We have vetted their messages. It is theologically correct. It is exegetically correct. But the fruits we are seeing is not consistent with the exegesis. So who are these messengers? And in the believer's convention, if there's anything we want to probe, we must probe ourselves. And so the third question this morning is, what am I 
emitting? What am I emitting? In my family, in my fellowship, in the place of work, what am I emitting? Is it Christ and his light I am emitting? Or is it anger? Or is it lust? Or is it arrogance? What am I emitting? So that you will learn how to purge and also to shield. Because every kingdom agent that will exercise government must master the art of purging and shielding. In fact, if you become a minister who travels a lot, you will see a lot of arrows the devil shoots at people. Sometimes you come out of your meeting. When you are in the venue, you are about to go up, then the devil will flash you. Flash, it will flash lost into your soul. Flash it with so much intensity. If you don't know how to shield yourself, you have prepared for a meeting, but you will carry lost to the altar. They are, they are, these guys are kingdom entities. They know how this thing works. He will bring you to a meeting. You are sat there. While you are seated there, he will flash you with something somebody said against you in the past. Or sometimes, as you are going for the meeting, if you don't know how to shield yourself, you just carry your phone. You want to read the Bible, you now punch on YouTube, punch on Facebook. Then you will see something that they cooked about you and it will choke your soul with so much bitterness and pain. And as you climb that altar, all you will be emitting will be pains and bitterness or insecurity. You will preach an intelligent message, but at the end of the day, the people that will live there will live there with a cause of bitterness. What are you emitting? If we are talking government, if we are talking kingdom, if we are talking dominion, these questions cannot be overemphasized. What do I look like? Where am I standing? What am I emitting? These are the credentials of a man who can bring the government of God to a people. I will stop here. The last thing I would have spoken about is the commissioning. That's the last thing about dominion. When you see Genesis 1, 28, let them have dominion. That's commissioning. If you see Mark 3, 14, he called them to be with him that he might send them. That's commissioning. But you see, these other credentials must be met before you are sent and sent to bring kingdom. But many times, when we talk dominion, we just jump at commissioning. And then we start talking about spheres of influence. We start talking about different strata. And time which time has already shown us that many who were sent were swallowed up by those mountains pastor shola was sharing with me yesterday how that apart from the fact that he believes in the word of god he also believes in patterns they don't lie we have sent many people to politics who were swallowed up i was with peter yesterday and he was telling me how that the cure to our societal problem is discipleship it's not just to send people all of us know about the mountains of influence, but who is being sent there? So when we talk kingdom, it's not first of all about evangelizing the world. It's not about taking the mountains of influence. Who is being sent? And so we have to come back to the drawing table. Because if you check this equation, being with him is longer than being without him when you are sent. Jesus was with him for 30 years. He was sent for three and a half years. That means every one year, of Jesus' kingdom exploit had 10 years foundation of discipleship and intimacy. Look at yourself this morning as I will look at my own self and let's ask these questions and sincerely answer them. I know you love God. I know you're passionate about God. I know you want God's kingdom, but who do you look like? When you check your everyday lifestyle, who do you look like? Do you look like the devil? Do you look like your society? Do you look like your biological parents? Do you look like adages, philosophies, ideologies of your ancestors? Or do you look like God? It is who you look like that you will emit. If you don't look like God, please don't make the mistake of thinking you will bring his kingdom. Because most of us look like the traditions of men. 
most of us look like our society. When three Christians are standing and you talk to them or you relate with them, you will know the one that is from Lagos. You will know the one that is from Onisha. And you know the one that is from Kanu. That means largely we look like our environment. That's why we can only build patterns that are consistent with our environment. And if we want, must have dominion, we must come out of all of those things and begin to resemble Christ. God servant said something yesterday. He said, this is the problem with Abiyokuta. They never sit down till the end of the meeting. That means most Christians look like Abiyokuta. So it's a difficult thing to exercise government. So before you jump to catch the prophecies, make sure you resolve these matters. If these matters cannot be resolved, you may need to take a retreat after this conference so that the things that will be released, you'll be able to make do with them. What do you look like? Where are you standing? And what are you emitting? Let's bow our heads and pray as we round up this session. The cure to human affliction is the grace of God. Can you ask him this morning, give me the grace to represent you and to be able to exercise your government. Give me the grace. Beyond emotions, beyond excitement, beyond all of the charade, I want to be genuine. I want to be genuine. I would rather be genuine and not have impact than to have impact that is not genuine. Because when I have impact that is not genuine, I would have made harvest for the devil. Cause me to be genuine. So that in being genuine, I will make impact. Make that prayer this morning. I want to look like you and you alone. I want the grace to stand in your presence and live from your presence. And Lord, I also want to emit a witness that is consistent only to your will. Please pray that prayer. Don't be quiet at this time. Don't be quiet. When I come for a meeting where there are many ministers, I try to find out the quota God will have me contribute. Because if you are not careful, all of us will end up doing the same thing. There are those God will send to this meeting for his power. There are those God will send to this meeting to give prophetic direction. But my one assignment in this meeting is to prepare your heart so that everything God will release, you'll be able to utilize them. May the Lord grant the grace that is required to be true kingdom ambassadors so that we can establish his government.